Hello everyone. Hi all the new friends. I'm so happy to see you here. For those who haven't met me, my name is Heidi Pustay, coordinator of Partnership Together. And this session is hosted by the Jewish community of Budapest today as part of the Partnership Together project, Here We Are. So each month, the partnership is thrilled to visit virtually one of the partnered communities. So that's how today we are visiting Budapest. Uh, for those uh, who are uh, new with the partnership, I would like to share a few information about what partnership is. So uh, our partnership is a platform for promoting people-to-people -people relationships through cultural, social, educational, and community-based programs. Our partnership family is made up of 16 Jewish communities in the central USA, two Israeli municipalities at the Western Galilee region, Akko and Matea Sher, and Budapest, Hungary. The partnership is part of the Jewish Agency Partnership Unit. There are 46 partnerships that engage and connect more than 350,000 Jewish people. The partnership mission is to promote mutually beneficial endeavors between the people of the Central Area Consortium, the Western Galilee and Budapest, forging relationships through shared responsibility and knowledge, embracing our diversity, harnessing innovation and reinforcing our continuity through programs that build Jewish identity and strengthen our communities by forming global connections among and between Israel, the United States, and Budapest. And now it's time to pass the mic to my great friend, Andre Ozvat, who is a wonderful volunteer of our partnership and also the best tour guide of Budapest. So we are very lucky today to have him on this call. So uh, Andre, the mic is yours. Just a short note to our guest. Please write your questions into the chat because at the end of the meeting, we will have time uh, to ask those questions. So we will read your questions to Andrea at the end of the meeting. Okay, not in between, but in the end. So enjoy our program and Andrea, the mic is yours. Thank you very much, Haley, And thank you for partnership for inviting me for this wonderful session. And then hi everyone. This is Budapest uh, from about, uh, Wow, 100 Fahrenheit, 36 Celsius, very, very hot, it's a heat wave, and I'm very, very happy to finally uh, guide the tour, and um, I'm very missing you from, from behind me, there are it's only police and not you, but hopefully very soon uh, we, can, we can host you in Budapest, like it was planned actually a year ago when Budapest was going to be the headquarters of all the, all the meetings and congresses and seminars for the partnership together. So my name is Andrea, Andrea Ozvat. I'm, I'm local, I'm from Budapest, and yes, you heard very well. I'm very, very glad to hear that I'm Hedy's friend because she's definitely mine. We've uh, worked together uh, and volunteered together for partnership, went together to Israel. And before, the way I known her, she was my Hebrew teacher. Yeah, thank you very much, Hedy, again, uh, for all the five words I still remember from your, from your uh, lessons, but it was not your fault. Finally, I'm only doing tours in, in English, but of course I know quite a lot in Hebrew as well. So where I am now is the central part of Budapest, a quite cosmopolitan area. This is the, I would say the local Jewish quarter of Budapest, even if until year 2000, we never really had a Jewish district which is quite controversial. And I could just say goodbye to you. Hi, it was great to see you. There's not even one Jewish district in Budapest. There is one. And this is why many people before the pandemic and hopefully soon again, will uh, were or will be visiting Budapest again. It's very important that once we had roughly one third population in Budapest that was Jewish and they built a beautiful, beautiful area. Um, why is it so special? Well, the tour is going to take about 45 minutes from now. And I think because we don't have that much time, I can just turn around and show you. Because of this guy here. This is the largest European synagogue. This is the Doha Street Synagogue, Doha Nutsa Ijinagoga. On this session, on this tour, I'm going to show you three of them. And unfortunately, thanks to the pandemic, they are not open. So we cannot really go inside. But from a distance, I can definitely show them to you. This is the Doha 
because of this road here, this street called Tobacco Street, Dohan Utsa in Hungarian. The synagogue is located on the Dohan Street, thanks the name, hence the name. This is why it's a tobacco synagogue, not like because of having two big cigars on top, you can see them. These are the towers, which is quite also unique. Let's say to have towers, synagogues in Budapest is not unique. And in Central Europe, it's quite common actually to have towered synagogues because the majority of the population was always Roman Catholic. And we have also many Protestant but Christian religions and the local Jews just wanted to fit in. They said, why don't we build our church so other people who live around us, they can accept us. We can communicate in a way that, yeah, that's your church, that's the other's church, and this is our church. Not many people had an idea that Jews don't have churches. They have the temple and they will have the temple one day when the Messiah comes. And at the moment, they have this wonderful, wondrous synagogue. I will switch the, the lens. It's a little bit more wide angle. So you can take a look at this magnificent, beautiful synagogue. Hebrew letters in the middle. Rose window. Twelve beautiful roses up there. Twelve of the, uh, 18 of them, sorry, 18 for, for good luck, for the good wishes. And the two towers. That may really resemble you to the big temple in Jerusalem that once was sacked and once destroyed. This is what the local Jews in 1854 to 1859 would construct, even if the architect was not Jewish, he was a main architect of Austria, Vienna. So he was a great name, a very big name. And he used all what he learned from archaeological excavations that were taking place in Mesopotamia area. And that's where people found more and more, well, decorations in the ground, such like these eight-pointed stars we can see. Quite unlikely you can find eight-pointed stars in synagogues, more like six-pointed stars. But don't forget that historically, geometry was very, very important for Jews and today for Muslims as well. And again, in the 19th century, not many people knew who Jews really were, what they brought with them, and this synagogue could be constructed. This building I'm showing you right now is not part of the synagogue, but it's part of the synagogue complex with these arches. Up there it houses the Jewish Museum. When visiting Budapest, you can tell to visit one synagogue and the Jewish Museum at the same time. And this is also a place where an apartment building used to stand before the current one was constructed. And let me show you another very interesting memorial plaque that would be here. You can read it very well. I don't know if it's mirrored or not, but you can clearly see Theodor Herzl. Yes, Theodor Herzl was born. Not in the synagogue, obviously, but definitely in the apartment house that used to stay right here. In about a minute, I can show you a photo that's on the wall when I'm walking around the synagogue complex, to be more exact. And I can show you definitely one picture that was shot on that building in the 1940s, 1840s, before it was torn down. So the synagogue has got several parts. The Dohan Shul itself was the one with the towers and this is the museum and pretty soon yes here we go i would show you this photograph i wish i could zoom in yes i can fantastic so you see that building on the left just by the synagogue with the tympanon the triangle on top in which the other Herzl was born he grew up here he was 13 years old when he and his family left to Austria and he died in Basel, Switzerland. He got buried in Budapest first. And then he wrote down in his last uh, will that once the Holy Land will be created, he wants to be buried there. So as many of you know, he's in Jerusalem now on the top of Mount Herzl. What else we can see here? First, here is a fence, just to zoom out a little. You can see it's a big arched hallway and fence, so we cannot get there. I showed you the photograph earlier, and we can also see quite a few tombstones. If you have been to Budapest, you've already seen this place, but if you have not, 
it might be surprising for you seeing so many tombstones because it's next to a synagogue. Again, the synagogue is, is right there. It's in the background. And here in the foreground, that would be the, they would be the plaques. So what is very surprising that this is not a very kosher place, to be honest. During the ghetto time, during 1944-45, if someone lived and died in the ghetto, which is pretty much this area, from right here, I will tell you even why, they died, volunteers from the buildings around, from all here, would bring the dead bodies down to this area because he was original in the, until the 1930s. This was a pond in the middle where people could come just uh, could come and, and walk around and pray. And this became the place where uh, thousands of bodies got collected. And later after uh, the, the Soviets came and some people say liberated, others say occupied, uh, the local community members were able to bury them. So 2,281 Jewish people are buried here, 1170 have not been identified, just the rest. So that's why you can find names written. And the other reason I stayed here is to show you this memorial plaque. No one can really read it if you don't know Hungarian, obviously it makes no sense. It says that this, um, this is um, the place where the, the ghetto wall stood that the Liberator Army would uh, the liberated Soviet army would dismantle. Well, not many Hungarians like to hear the word liberator and Soviet in the same word, but I have to say that during the ghetto time, if the Soviets didn't come, everybody would have died. So from the point of view of those Jews who lived in the ghetto, they were liberators. I personally have various feelings. One way I understand it. On the other hand, for 45 years, the Soviets took so much damage in the Hungarian history. It was very difficult. Hungary became a satellite country, not part of the USSR, yet still their Soviet troops stayed in Hungary. So I cannot really call it liberation, but that one moment when the Soviets broke in and they finally gave hope to those Jews who lived here because finally they could get out and they could get some food, that seemed to be the liberation. When we look up, we see two types of buildings, one here, here the, the window colors are white, whereas here the window colors are blue. Not because it means anything, and not because of the flag of Israel, I can tell. It's only because one, or one uh, people who live here, uh, the concierge in the, in the house decided to paint it blue, the other decided to paint it white. I can just only show you because they do look pretty much the same. So not many people would know that, that these are separate. This is where the wall stood, right here in between the two. So this building with the white windows, they stayed, it stayed outside the ghetto and they stayed inside the ghetto. And that's why the black is located right here. So we are entering the ghetto. Ghetto, the word, many people think it's a very derogative term for a district, uh, an area uh, in any cities where very poor people live there. Uh, conditions are, are on the normal, terrible area, but really it is an area in Venice, in Italy, where the Jews used to live. And that was called the Ghetto Nuevo, or Ghetto Vecchio, two parts, the old and the new ghetto area, unrelated to bad conditions. It was just a Jewish district. And later and later, other relatively closed areas in Italy got the name Ghetto, hence the area in Venice. And during World War II, remembering that in Middle Ages, Jews had to live in certain areas called the ghetto back then. These got called ghetto where the conditions got extreme. And in retrospect, people would determine the ghettos as something very bad and something very wrong. So in that time, it was an area where thousands of Jews, 10,000, and in the end, 100,000 in this area, seven by three blocks, so very, very small area, had to live. And in retrospect, we think of something very bad. And then the moment, if I say ghetto, you don't even think of Jews. You, you think of maybe some South American or, or even Mexican or, or Balkan uh, in, in Europe or somewhere very poor. People live in favelas, for example, in, in temporary buildings where poverty is big and usually it's related, associated with very big crime rate as well. 
So once again, I'd like to show you this area with the grapes. Zooming in again. So many times there are names and just the number 1944-45 because they were uncertain if the person died in 44 or 45, the first day of 45 or last day of 44. Surprising fact that Budapest ghetto existed only for very short time, only just 56 days. So end of 3rd of December, 44 and 18th of January, 45, but because of conditions were so extreme, we can never really say it was so easy to survive that short period of time. And at this right moment, we've left this arcade. I showed you that the, uh, the cemetery was that way, but here there's something else. You see, finally, Stars of Davids, right? In the Jewish district. Well, we could be somewhere in Jerusalem right now. Look at the colors. Look at this beautiful limestone. In Budapest, outside Budapest, we have also a very beautiful limestone quarry. That's where the word, uh, the constructive material comes from. And when passing it by, we can see this amazing Babylonian style kind of Bauhaus, a little bit of Art Deco building. Now you can tell it is a synagogue and on top, you can also find Star of David. That's relatively new. It was placed uh, there in 1991. Not before. The synagogue dates back uh, to only 1931. Surprising, I know. Next to the Grand Synagogue, the big one over there. So gigantic, a much smaller one. I just bumped into a, something, sorry. So now we can see this big synagogue on the left and the Somo synagogue on the right to give you a better, fact, a better picture. I walk a little farther and from this distance you can tell the two are totally different in size. Yeah, you can see the fence after the parliament building in Budapest, the synagogue complex is the second most protected building complex in Budapest for good reason, but luckily anti-Semitism isn't very big here. We can always hear some, some words, we can always hear people complaining about Jews, but as I always say, I'm very happy to hear about anti-Semitism in Hungary because it means that Jews still exist. So, Grand Synagogue, and then this one is from 1931, the Temple of the Heroes, the only synagogue in the country with a real name, reminding you that the Grand Synagogue has got the name Tobacco, hence the location, the tobacco area. And what's here? Behind the synagogue, it's a very picturesque and beautiful location. This is a tree of life. If you can count, I leave you some time. There are seven main branches of this, seven branches. So if you turn it upside down, I'm trying to do that. Uh, yeah, just a moment. So take a look at this. No, I tried to switch off, but it, it doesn't work. Try it again. Uh -uh. Zoom is too smart. If I turn it upside down, it will come back. So anyway, if you turn it upside down, it will look like a menorah. Uh, that's very important. So that makes it definitely Jewish. If I zoom in, you can also identify the little leaves on the branches. Each of these leaves contain a name, a name engraved on them, a uh, name of a victim. So we have 600,000 Hungarian Jews died, killed, murdered in Holocaust. That is 10% of all victims, all people who were killed, murdered in this genocide, in this pogrom. And of this 10% is from here. And this is only one tenth, 1%, 1 sorry, 6,000 out of the 600,000. The names are engraved. If you come here in July, the first Sunday on July, the local community, uh, whose offices are in this building, Emanuel Foundation, 
for a small donation, they will engrave your relative's name as well. So what to find in this Emmanuel Foundation and why the name? Uh, it's because of this gentleman whose name is on the wall. I hope you can read it from a distance. It is the Memorial Park of Raoul Wallenberg. Unfortunately, I cannot zoom in more. I cannot go any closer, but hopefully you can read. Raoul Wallenberg, very well-known name here uh, in, in the United States of America, also in many Anglo-Saxon countries, not much in Budapest, not much in Hungary. Uh, not everyone, but more and more people now hear about him. He was a Swedish ambassador, a Swedish diplomat, and he's tried to save as many Jews as possible. He succeeded to save quite a few, almost 100,000 just in Budapest. So this is how we can have so many survivors. This area, this entire area was dedicated to him. And in the very center, that would be Tree of Life, his father, Emmanuel Schwartz, would be the one who migrated. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, I just mixed it up. Tony Curtis, who founded this tree. Tony Curtis, yeah. Bernie Schwartz, the movie star. His father, who migrated from Mate Saka to the US. So Tony Curtis was born in the US uh, already. For his memory, his, his son dedicated this, this building as also a small synagogue and, and uh, rabbinical offices and basically the center of this whole neolog community. On the way walking to the next site, I'd like to just say a couple of words about the neology. You can already say, you can hear neo, so something new in it. Neolog is a new term, new idea, logos, logum. English word log also if something is written as a codex, maybe a uh, text. Neology is a relatively new idea in the 19th century, it comes from the German Maschkil or Maschkil communities. Um, from to west from here, because we are in the center, center of Europe, the west from here can be found Germany, and that's where always the more modern, more liberal and different uh, ideas always came. For example, this Maschkil. So imagine that whoever in the 19th century living in Hungary, living in Budapest, mostly in Hungary, Jews, most of them migrated through, from either uh, Bohemia, which is today Czech, Czechia, to be uh, precise. Some years ago, it was Czech Republic. Now it's Czechia. Uh, so the Czech Jews, that was one way, and the others were uh, Czechs, Moravian Jews, and the others were mostly the, the Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarus, Belarusian Jews. They came here to Central Europe and and whoever arrived to the western part of the country, uh, they mostly became the more liberal Jews and the eastern part there. For example, my grandmother from my mother's side is from, um, that is the more orthodox, more Hasidic as well in some way, ways uh, people would live. So there's a very big difference, very big split, about 50% orthodox and 50% who wanted to change something. And these wanted to change something, people became the neologues. Okay, in Budapest, it's very well uh, visible. We saw already the neologue school, the uh, Dohang already. And where we're going now is also a neologue place, but a little bit more uh, more authentic, more traditional branch in the big synagogue as we couldn't get in. Unfortunately, I couldn't have shown you the organ, this musical instrument in this synagogue that has got two towers. For the Orthodoxes, it was almost impossible to install synagogues with musical instruments. They could even play on Saturday. Obviously, a uh, non-Jew would play on the organ, but still there is music in the synagogue and that's something new. Uh, this one I'm going to show you right now in about a minute. They did not have organ. It was an octagonal, very old shape, old traditional shape, yet it was still neolog and not orthodox. So somewhere in between the two, and there will be one by the end, which is definitely orthodox. But uh, let, me, let me brag a little bit, because we do not only have um, beautiful buildings, but something that we call modern. So this is the most decorative building. I wanted to talk about this. It's an electric um, transformer building because at the moment in Venice, there is uh, the, the Biennale, 
and uh, Budapest, the Hungarian, uh, Hungarian pavilion introduces the 1960s and 70s, the most special buildings from the city. So this is one of the representatives. What do you think? Uh, Swedish style, they say. Well, if you've ever played with Lego, you know what I mean. And if you've ever played with a Rubik's Cube, well, that's something more Hungarian, definitely more Hungarian. This is a giant Rubik's Cube. It's painted on the wall. It's a big mural. So this is where I can talk about some urban arts. This area is very artistic. And next to the beautiful Rubik's Cube, again, that was invented by Edna Rubik, a Hungarian. Yes, a Hungarian inventor from the 1980s. At the moment, you can already see something interesting in the back. I hadn't talked about Muslim communities here in Budapest. They have three uh, praying rooms uh, in Budapest and the big mosque, but this is none of them. That's something different. This is a, this is the synagogue as well. But before getting there, this is 6-3, the fantastic success from 19... <clears throat> 53, when Hungary played at the Wembley Stadium against Britain, and they won, they beat the English team at home. So for that anniversary, for the 60th anniversary, we painted it up. And never forget that Hungarians, again, after so many years, are qualified for the Euro Cup. And yesterday, we made a row with France, which is unacceptably great for us. It's the first time in my life, I could actually cheer for the Hungarian team and I enjoyed it as well because it was not a very big defeat. So if you are interested, on Saturday at three o'clock we play with Germany. So here we go. This is something else. Architecturally pretty different, different, uh, similar to what we saw at the beginning. The Dohan, although something is very different, the shape of the towers. Again, I told you we have Muslims, but no Muslims would take the minaret next to the, our, uh, the tablets of the Ten Commandments. Yes, that's where they are. So this is how we can tell. This is definitely a synagogue. This is the Rumbach Shebeshtin synagogue. Again, it was also neolog, but a little bit more orthodox is orthodoxish French of this uh, neology and thanks for lord this 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 building was just renovated it's not open yet of course the renovation took about six months then it was postponed to about three years and finally it's ready i haven't seen it this beautiful no reconstruction no painters i cannot stand painters since i've painted as well i'm learning to become a painter at the moment so this is another one out of the three, the second synagogue on the Rumbach Shebeshtin street. Sebastian Rumbach is a different person. You may think he's Jewish, he's not, he's a doctor. And he realized there is a very good curativeness of, of the water we have here. I'm not talking about this, but I'm talking about a spring water we have we have the Danube, of course, that provides no of fresh drinking water to Budapest, but something else is, is different. That's the thermal water. We have thermal springs and thermal baths in Budapest. That's we, that we are very famous for. It's not only for, uh, for fun. When you get in there, it's basically body temperature, but also it's for, uh, it's for rejuvenation. It's good for the joints. And this is good for the joints as well. Some, some drinking here. This is the most hipsterish part of the city. I told you about it, right? Before the pandemic, this was a quite vivid area. And finally, at the moment, I can say some bars are getting filled up with people. And that arch is basically another entrance to the Jewish district from the Modach uh, Square, Modach Avenue. When we turn around, we see other hipsterish buildings and these ones at the corner. It could be also somewhere in Tel Aviv. Again, Bauhaus, Bauhaus 1930 style. So this is relatively modern part of, of the capital city. Although Budapest is known mostly for historic architecture, 19th century, Baroque, 
classical, everything that from the past, from about two, 3,000 years, covering everything, all kinds of styles. This area is relatively new from between the first and the second world war period. So what I'm walking now is, uh, is the Kirai Utsa. Kirai means king in Hungary. And Kirai Utsa is known for, back then in the 19th century, fun. That's where the bars, these kind of bars, pubs and restaurants were located. And uh, because prostitution was also illegal in the old town, this is where it could all happen. So we had brothels, we had hotels, we had all kind of fun. Let me show that to you. So Kirai means king because at the end of the road, that way actually, was a restaurant and that was dedicated to the king of England. Not himself, it was just called the, the restaurant of the king of England. And that used to be kind of 19th century Facebook. You got in there and you were looking for job. There was definitely someone who knew you uh, an occupation. That was his, his job to find you something on your uh, curriculum and maybe a table number two, you could find a job or table number five was always the matchmaker. You could get married very easy. So Facebook. Yeah, Facebook and Tinder at the same time with some Instagram features. That was Kirai Utsa. So this street with the historic architecture I mentioned earlier, that is named after the restaurant of the King of England, because this is the road that leads you to the King of England. The restaurant is not there anymore. The name still stays. And as walking down, you see, the oldest buildings of the 19th century, the 1830s, 1840s, on the right side. And this one is a little different. That's the Gauche du built building, the Gauche du Passage. Here you can read a little bit about Emmanuel Gauche du. This is whom he was, Romanian lawyer. This Romanian lawyer who was actually the first one who talked in Hungarian, used the Hungarian, not, not Latin in the Hungarian court. And he was pretty charities. He constructed a branch of buildings. It's seven buildings altogether. And as you see these two walking down, there are arc, uh, some uh, yards and buildings and yards and buildings, kind of courtyard area, seven buildings, and six courtyards. This is today the center of bars and pubs. Mm -hmm. And I've never seen this so empty at this time of the day. Before the pandemic, of course, it was also quite busy. Not to mention this big room here. That's where different vendors used to be and you could buy local stuff. So in case you come back to Budapest, uh, hopefully this is going to be the area where you can get some nice lunch or even better dinner. And as walking down this street, we will get to the ghetto uh, wall area because we are actually outside the ghetto. It's very hard to tell when we are inside and when we are outside. This is definitely outside. And here is a door, this is a gate. It says this is entrance for cars. It's not very good looking. I can tell we are outside the ghetto. The condition of some, some buildings are not so good. Until five years ago, this belonged to the local government. Now it is sold to investors and local uh, people who live here. And what we can only tell is here is a memorial in three languages. I show you the English at this moment. So I can give you time to read if you're interested. I like to point you out this part. Memorial Wall was built in their memory in 2010, replacing the original one destroyed in six. What am I talking about? So here's a gate. Here's a little people. And now we can see the same, right? So here is a, a court. And there is a wall. 
that forbids us to go any further. And that is the reconstructed ghetto wall. Well, there's not much there and locals don't really like to get bothered. But recently I got the code. Just one moment, I'll be back. Okay, here I am. I just had to. At the moment. So, this is the inner yard. The locals don't really like us to film here for understandable reasons. This is their property. What's also very, very important is the wall. When I first came here, In this door, behind this door, an old lady lived. So it's so cute little box. Today we can find uh, the gas wall, but before this was in uh, the small box, the food delivery took her food. So she told me in her life, she asked me very nicely not to talk about what she knows because she was very afraid. She grew up in communism and in communism, you know, people are always afraid, scared of things. Maybe if they say uh, something that, other people should not have heard, they can get in trouble. Unfortunately, she passed away some years ago. So since I have thought that maybe I can say that the building is in this condition, the building on the other side is in, in great condition. It's, it's actually new, it was built 10 years ago. You can tell, right? So it's such a separator of old and new. And this is the wall, but this is not where the wall supposed to be. It was about a few meters away. But when this new building got constructed, they needed a garage and the ramp, the way down to the garage, it got blocked by this wall. So the workers, they said they were ignorant. They wouldn't know what this was and they uh, tore it down. So locals, including a lady from the Orthodox Jewish community, they complained and they told the government that it is going to, uh, have uh, they're going to suffer from consequences and so the local government fixed it up and they rebuilt it they even placed a small memorial in here and that shows you also the wall map so the ghetto map with my different camera so this is where we began here is a little park I told you earlier the ghetto had seven by three blocks in where about 14,000 people used to live before the ghetto was constructed. And then during the ghetto, 100,000. Imagine the difference. And from here, whoever died, they were either placed at Klausa Square or by the synagogue. This is where we saw the cemetery, this little place. 2,211 are still, 81, sorry, are still buried there. I say temporarily because no Jews can be buried by the synagogue. So they're just waiting for the time. Everyone will be exhumed and brought to Jerusalem. This is what they wish for. I hardly think it's gonna happen soon, but there is always a chance. And this is where we are, right outside the ghetto wall and this little piece of the black line would be the wall I'm touching right now. So I think it's quite time to leave this and a haunted house area. There's only one place from going to the region, the Orthodox area. So we have seen the Neolog, we've seen uh, the Kirayutsa. Also, we saw the, uh, the Rumba Shebestian synagogue, which is in between. The and in a minute, we're gonna see the Orthodox area as well. So this part is full of beautiful surprises and interesting surprises as well. When somebody gets married, usually they go on a, on a party before, and a bachelor party or a hand party. This is where usually people are having fun. So before we get to the Orthodox, let me say a couple of words about myself. I'm 34 years old. I grew up here. I'm from the Buddha side of, of the 
capital city. If you were with us a year ago, uh, a little bit more than a year ago, also sponsored by the partnership, I guided you around Budapest. I was not on the street because thanks to the pandemic, it was not, not possible. I used my laptop and I, I had a one hour long tour about generally Budapest. And I also showed you that the city has got two parts, Buda and Pest. This is Pest. It's flat, it's vivid, it's where everything matters and happens. And it is two thirds of Budapest in size. Whereas Buda is a little more quieter, it's residential, one third of the city, and, and a little bit even more expensive at some parts, especially the downtown area. That's where the Royal Palace is built. So that's uh, the posh area. But to live there, hmm, it's a little boring. So both sides have got heads, uh, uh, pros and contrasts as well. When switching the camera again to the other one, we can be amused by beautiful architecture again. Some parks with murals. I told you about the locals painting on the walls. Amazing, nice murals. This is the first one that was ever decorating Budapest. And the winter can be pretty harsh here. We can go sub-zero, not this winter, but usually it can be very, very cold. We have snow as well. And when it snows, there are no trees, leaves at all. So we painted trees on the wall. When you come here, even in the winter, it's something like a bright island in the clouds. And why is the park here? Why is the playground? Well, you see the sign Moto Pizza at the moment. Until two years ago, a very famous Hungarian uh, Olympic winner. I was looking for the sign, whether it says anything about him, but not yet. An Olympic silver, twice silver and once bronze medal winner, uh, Mr. Wichmann, Tomasz uh, Wichmann, who won uh, in canoeing. He owned his little dive bar. So it's not a restaurant, it's, it's a dive bar. I can tell. Condition was extremely bad. The toilets stank. Oh my God. But that was a place I had to bring all my, all, all my friends to because that was real authentic. You could meet the owner, the, the champion as well. And two years ago, unfortunately, I died in cancer. So we decided, of course, to close it down a couple of months before that and uh, it got turned into a pizzeria. You see quite a lot of crowd around me, right? People hanging out, going drinking. Also, you can see some, some bars with open air area. These ones are called the ruin bars because the conditions, thanks to these <laughs> graffitis, for example, that are unrelated to gangs, totally. With some young, let's say teenagers, find fun and uh, painting something or tagging their names on the walls. Amongst them, we have these big murals again, that are uh, advertisings. So, bigger companies like uh, tonic water companies or alcohol companies would sponsor. Uh, so, amongst these buildings, some people decided to open bars and restaurants. Sometimes they got very successful. For example, this one, the Mates Bistro. Unfortunately, they have not reopened. Although they decided or realized that in the Jewish district, it's pretty difficult to find non-kosher or not necessarily kosher, but Jewish food. Matzes is matzah. And Hussar, who sits on the horse, is a typical Hungarian soldier. They had great matzo ball soup. They have a nice, nice variety of Hungarian Jewish dishes. For example, the local Sholent or Chunt, Hamin, different names. Uh, that's a Hungarian Jewish food all Hungarians know. Not necessarily everyone knows it's Jewish food, but everyone knows. Bean. And sometimes people add some pork fat and smoked pork neck in it not knowing what the original tradition was. So next to the bistro, you find kosher, real kosher, yes. 
Carmel is real kosher. This is one of the three kosher restaurants. So that would be here. Another one's there, in there, the Hana. And the third one is on this side, is the Halavi. So three kosher restaurants, because mostly local Jews are not Orthodox or not kosher, just a few of them, and three restaurants seem to be quite enough. And why I'm holding you the camera this way, it's because finally we got to the Orthodox. This is the Orthodox synagogue, very different from the rest. You see the tablets of the Ten Commandments in the middle. You don't have to look up to the top. But wait a minute, we've got tulips. Why do we have tulips on the windows? Why do we have red, green, and, and white colors? Maybe you are familiar with the Hungarian flag, red, white, and green. And also the tulips in Hungarian art, they represent beautiful ladies. Oh yeah, now I understand, because these Jews are Hungarian Orthodox. So ladies prefer to be seated upstairs, separately from men. And because the Hungarian art means that tulip is for women, women's area is located and shown on top. So this looks like a little tower building, brick building, the Orthodox community quite poor, they could not afford to build a bigger synagogue. Loeffler brothers, the Jewish uh, their brothers, they were architects and they designed this masterpiece right before First World War, 1911, got finished in 1913. It was not a joke. I told you earlier that I'm becoming a painter because I had to choose a different occupation and I love architecture so much. I always believe that one day I can paint, I can get into old apartments like, like something in the city center just for a paint and, and it really make, um, would make me happy to, to renovate something that's, that's from, the, from the history. And ladies and gentlemen, a week ago, I got into an apartment in downtown of Buda and I got suspicious. I said, come on. The chandeliers look very similar uh, to what we see here. And then I walked outside and I saw that the architects are the same people. So yeah, finally, my wish came true. I could get into another Loeffler brother building and I could renovate it so well. Hopefully they are pretty proud of me at the moment. And finally, the third kosher, this is a Halavi. First time they have table outside. Because of the pandemic, they closed down so many areas. And because we have a new mayor, this mayor promotes uh, more uh, walking areas, some green areas in the city. And thanks to that, this has become a one-way street. And again, more and more uh, entrepreneurs uh, could open bars and restaurants having tables outside. The last part, where I'm taking you, and I give you some time for questions, because this is what I promised, is the mikveh, the ritual bath of Budapest, and not only Budapest, but I'd say Central Europe. I have heard of Serbians, Serbian ladies, who come and visit this mikveh once a month, because the Serbs, whom are our uh, neighbors to the south, their communities are pretty small, and they don't have active mikvehs in their countries. Belgrade is a three and a half hour drive from Budapest. They drive here every month, a month, and they visit the mikveh. Take a look at beautiful buildings again. Art Nouveau, so the new art. And by the end of the street, we try not to get hit, sorry. Okay. At the end of the street, the white building on the left side, you just see a little piece of it. Uh, that piece, that's the Temple of the Heroes. Okay, so we walk the circle. That's where I started. From there, I walk down that way, imagining Rumbach Synagogue and then the Kirai Street all the way down to the Orthodox area and here down to the mikveh. Mikveh, 
ritual, but in Hungary we now we have several. We have one in Bodro Keresztúr, that's the Tokai wine region. I see a question, it is almost 8 o'clock, 8 p.m., 7.53 local time. So the Mikve building here, it doesn't look so good, but inside it's totally renovated, thanks to uh, lots of donations from the U.S. American Jewish communities. The chimney at the back backyard, also part of it. They had the central heatings back then, and this is the Mikve building. Pretty surprisingly, why do I say that? Not many people would know what this building's function is because here is a street food garden. You come here during no pandemic period and you see food trucks everywhere, different types of food, vegan, local, not so local, even langosh. That's my personal favorite. It's a cottage cheese, uh, cheese and sour cream dough that's fried in oil so that's one part where you find many people and this not so good looking building the simpler is a very very unique part of budapest as well this is the main ruin bar i told you earlier now you wonder don't wonder anymore why it is called ruined or ruiny take a look at it almost no plaster just the walls wait a minute here is a urinal on the wall in which you see plants planted. Crazy. This is a decoration, a European Union flag. Building is from 1838. We deserve something better, you may think. But it actually, this is quite good. It's got, yes, it's got beautiful and special interior. It's like Alice in Wonderland. So Simpla also houses markets here, farmers markets on the weekends. We've got souvenir shop. Speaking of Alice in Wonderland now, we've got a rabbit. It seems Susan's been here. Hope you had a great time. Yeah, this is definitely a great place. We've got a bathtub here. What to do in there? Oh, come on, there's a cushion there, so you can even sit here or sleep or or or, or sit here. We've got chess board, press button, something happens in the room. Uh, or or, 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 or not, 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 not today, but uh, it used to work for me. And now we can go outside. Beautiful and free. Green scenery, many times live music. This is one of the most ruined parts of Budapest. I'm not surprised that this place is still full of people, even if we have lockdowns. About 55% of Hungarians are now vaccinated. So it gives more and more permission to you to come here and to drink. The main reason I came here now is to show you now the screen. Yes, here's a screen <laughs> overgrown grown by, by fans. This is on which movies got projected from the cinema room. Now you can get it. On to the wall of the Mikvah. So imagine, this is the most known bar in Budapest. And where you can enjoy having your drink. Watching the movie is actually on the wall of the only surviving Mikve that's 93 years old of Budapest. And thank you very much for your attention. In about one hour, I try to sum up everything I could tell you about this district. Thanks for following us. And uh, I think you've had some time to pose some questions. And Gil or Heidi, I'd like to ask you to tell me the questions because I, I cannot really switch uh, to the to the other um, other screens. Okay, so we had a question in the beginning yes. at the Dohain synagogue. Why did they need a second synagogue right next to it? Okay, thanks for the question. So the question was why they had to build a second synagogue next to the after the next to the big one. 
Well, um, I had various reasons. Most likely is because uh, many Hungarians in First World War, they died as veterans on the battlefields. I know it surprises many people. How comes it happens during World War I? There is no such thing as anti-Semitism in public. Of course, there always has been anti-Semitism. And I had the my very bad joke at the beginning of the that I hope it will happen because it means that we always survive. But back then, it was before Nazism was introduced in Germany, fascism in Italy, and also in Hungary by the Hungarian Arrow Cross. So thanks to those Hungarian Jewish soldiers who sacrificed their lives on the battlefield and died for this country, the temple of the heroes, hence the veterans, would be constructed in 1931 next to the Red Synagogue. At the moment, because the Grand Synagogue has got 3,000 seats, it's very big, the end the community is quite small. The small one is used for winter, thanks for the heating, it can get very chilly, I told you, in winter. The small one is much easier to be heated, it has only 300 seats. Many of women are not separated, they have separate roles, left side women, right side men. Thanks for the question. Katie? Actually, we just want to say thank you because actually we have to close this meeting. So many, many comments also in the chat of thank you very much. It was great. So this thank is what you. I can tell you on behalf of the entire family of Partnership Together. Thank you very much for this wonderful tour. And uh, I hope that uh, even those who haven't had the chance to visit our community now do want to come. So please yeah. come. We are always there to host you and uh, be your family far from your home as well. Uh, so just a few closing words about our partnership which is a way to bridge the gap of understanding and bring us together in the spirit of our faith. It's not only creates deep interpersonal relationships that transcend location, but it also celebrates our rich heritage, our differences, and the culture that unites us all. We harness the power of our collective. Thank you very much to all our lay leaders, our staff people, special thanks to Heidi Benish and Gia Klempern who worked a lot on this event and uh, to all our uh, uh, wonderful members of this uh, global Jewish family. So again, thank you, Andrea, and keep in touch, stay safe and see you in Budapest. Thank you so much. Have a nice day, good night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye-bye.